Thank you very much for coming to my talk. Um, if you wish to interrupt at any moment or any time, interrupt at will. Um, and let me just get this started. All right. Um, the talk's going to be on the future of memory. And um, this is our nice logo, which we set up for our Glamex lab a couple of years ago, which didn't conform to the university's style sheet or brand. And we put an X at the top there just to denote um, the, the, the impossibilities. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. This is a black obsidian mirror. Um, the ancient uh, Aztec priests used to use these sorts of mirrors to gaze into the future uh, and predict things. This one was um, pilfered um, during the um, invasions and made its way into the library of Dr. John Dee, who was an Elizabethan math uh, mathematician and astrologer to Queen Elizabeth I. And um, this is one of these sorts of things which he used along with crystal balls in order to talk to angels. We think that the reason why he wanted to talk to angels is because in November of 1572, uh, a new star appeared in the sky um, in the constellation of Cassiopeia. And it formed a cross. And at that time, it was seen as a symbol that God was wanting to basically send a message to people on Earth. So people like John Dee, who sort of stood between science and magic, saw it as a time for maybe if I can start talking to these angels, maybe they can give me some inside knowledge on what God is planning to do to all of humanity. Um, this is, uh, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but that's John Dee staring into a crystal ball with his, um, probably his helper, which was Edward Kelly, to get information from the angels. He created um, this funny little object called uh, the Monus Hieroglyphica because Elizabethan and Renaissance magicians were obsessed in tapping into unlimited knowledge and they belie believed that this un unlimited knowledge was divine in origin and it gave you the key to the workings of the of the world. Uh, in Italy uh, we had Giordano Bruno who was doing a similar thing um, with the art of memory. Uh, these people were trying to basically create some sort of key to unlock unlimited knowledge um, through some sort of sigil or some sort of magic that would un unlock these sorts of ideas in our, in our mind. Um, there was also Tommaso Campanello He's an Italian who came up with a, a book called The City of the Sun, which was a utopian, um, a utopian vision of this wonderful city that was, had seven walls, and on those walls was the entire sum knowledge of everything that humanity had ever created. And it was supposed to be there in, in contact for the people to enjoy knowledge in all its forms. Now, one third of the book was dedicated to that utopian vision of knowledge and learning, and two thirds of the book were dedicated to um, defending it. These were my manuscript notes from 1995 when I read the book and I made my own little things. It's now water damaged on that side and it looks like an ancient manuscript, but it's only circa 1995. This is this, I'm giving you all these funny little things um, because in order to predict the future, we need to understand what's happened in the past. This is the Steganographia, which is, was written by Joannes Trothemius, and to me, I see the birth of the internet in this book. This was a book of cryptography uh, masquerading as a book of demonic magic, and he wanted to send messages across across the world, um, but they didn't have the technologies of today. So the way that they did it was that they'd send messages to the angels at the moon, and the angels at the moon would communicate the messages to other angels. So they had the, the, the wish to do these things. What they didn't have is the scientific infrastructure that we have today in order to do it. But the dreams were there. So I always see these ancient ideas as being ancient dreams of people, right? 
wanting this sort of access to universal knowledge, universal communications, but not having the scientific gizmos in order to make it occur. Um, the art of memory itself, in terms of the ancient art of memory, was tr retraced by this um, woman, uh, Dame Frances Yates, um, who's probably my favourite academic ever. She wrote this lovely book in 1966, and, and she retraced um, the birth of, uh, of how people used to remember before printing. And it was an interesting sort of ancient idea whereby you had to remember um, things according to places, um, locations, and really exciting sort of bizarre things. The more bizarre you encased what you wanted to remember, the more you remembered it. And, um, and this is how people used to remember things before um, writing had been invented. Um, the same sort of idea has come recently in a book by Lynn Kelly uh, called The Memory Code, which uh, uh, sort of applies some of these ideas on an Aboriginal level. So the Aborigines were doing the same sort of thing in terms of their landscape um, that is, 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 is outlined in that book by um, Dame Frances Yates. There's a beautiful passage in that book which I've got to read. Um, it's about the god Thoth um, going to the king of Egypt and letting him know about his wonderful invention of letters. And he said, uh, this invention, O king, said Thoth, will make the Egyptians wiser and will improve their memories, for it is an elixir of memory and wisdom that I have discovered. But Thamus replied, that's the king of Egypt, most ingenious Thoth, one man has the ability to beget arts, but the ability to judge of their usefulness or harmfulness to the users belongs to another. And now you, who are the father of letters, have been led by your affection to ascribe to them a power the opposite of that which they really possess. For this invention will produce forgetfulness in the minds of those who learn to use it, because they will not practice their memory. Their trust in writing, produced by external characters which are not part of themselves, will discourage the use of their own memory within them. You have invented an elixir not of memory, but of reminding, and you offer your pupils the appearance of wisdom, not true wisdom, for they will read many things without instruction and will therefore seem to know many things when they are not, for the most part, ignorant and hard to get along with, since they are not wise, but only appear to be wise. So... That's the god Thoth going with the invention of letters and the king saying, sorry, but you've actually, you've actually invented something. We'll, it will cause us to forget things. And this is why we all sit in the room together today. Now, the black obsidian mirror of today is that, our computer screens. You know, when I see my Apple Mac all by itself, I see John Dee's black obsidian mirror. And do you know what the angels are? The angels to me are Google. You put, type something into Google, and the angels respond with the knowledge of the world. This is a dream. These Renaissance magicians were sort of craving the sort of world that we are in now. But that's our black obsidian mirror. And uh, this is a scene from Cloud Atlas where um, the archivist is undertaking a, a, an oral history. Ordinarily, I, begun, I begin by asking prisoners to recall their earliest memories to provide the context for corporatic historians of the future. And the slave replies, fabricants have no such memories, archivists. So again, um, coming from Newcastle, that was established in, New in Australia, which was a prison within a prison. Um, here are some of my um, fellow prisoners. Um, and without these sorts of memories, uh, we can have no freedom. All right, so this is something that's really become uh, an obsession of mine in order to be able to uh, unlock as much of this sort of um, memory as possible. And the digital world has been that way that we've been doing it, and it's been wonderful. Uh, in 2016, we established um, a Glamex lab. Um, we took the inspiration from the idea of glam being borderless uh, in terms of covering the whole gamut of all things. Um, so we just decided to put a, an X on the end just so that we'd take in anything else that anyone could think about. We didn't want to put any limits. Uh, we wanted to create a space where students could be placed in contact with 50,000 years um, of human expression in all its archival forms and formats. 
um, we wanted a place where our students could actually touch and physically be with um, the material. Because it worried me that everyone was just too obsessed in the digital and they didn't really know where these things were coming from. Um, and we also wanted to improve their, their, their job and their networking, all right? So we wanted them to be able to tangibly connect with the communities that, they, that they'd grown up with, the community that had helped create the university, um, to meet people, to form connections, to be able to put things online that um, were part of that community. And, you know, people love it when, you know, work like this is done. Uh, we also took the challenge of digitising um, the local TV channel, um, MBN Television, that had been recording uh, news stories and programs since 1962. Um, so Channel 9, their parent company, and them are now not a... They couldn't care less about their past. They're too busy trying to survive in the digital world. And so there's about a million foot of footage which uh, these um, dedicated volunteers, uh, that's Phil... Phil up there, Phil Lloyd, um, he just came with me with a, bo book, a box of black boxes of all the films that he'd already digitised and I just backed them up to the university servers. Uh, that broke the university servers and then we just started discussions on how to get more space. So eventually I got Central Station, which was about a, cu a couple of hundred terabytes of um, material and we've been digitising as we go. And he's got a collection, it's like a men's shed in there because they're all, all ex-production uh, camera men type of people. Um, but they're fantastic for our students because they come from a world where um, the evolution of how they had to get broadcast materials over the air changed so much. So the early footage is sort of like black and white silent with scripts. It's all in bits and pieces and we use our digital platform to bring those bits and pieces together. And the students are now involved. We've got a pilot project to try and reconstruct some of these early films. So there's lots of interaction that goes on between the materials of the past and the students now to create something that will last um, that's a redundant format. And these are our work integrated learning projects. We've got a room dedicated to 3D digitization of Aboriginal artifacts. So we've got a site in Newcastle that's um, six and a half thousand years old. It was an Aboriginal factory site. Three layers, three worlds of um, human habitation on that site. And uh, they decided to build what? What do you think they built over the top of it? A museum, a steelworks, shopping centre, close? Car park, no. Oh, sort of, yeah. You're half right. What's the other end of the car park? It's a KFC. <laughs> That's what they built over the top of it. Anyway, uh, there was a bit of a furor and it caused a bit of uh, angst. Uh, it was on the front page of the Herald and it triggered a review of the Act. So the Act Governing Aboriginal Heritage is now in review across the state of New South Wales. Um, this is the community impact of the stuff that we've been digitising. Uh, when we moved over to the servers uh, from about 1996, we've generated 350 million files. So that's digital things. And they've just been spread out across, you know, Flickr, YouTube, whatever we can find to spread these things out. The latest has been our Living Histories at UON digital platform, which is made by a New Zealand company. You, um, They've got a stall, I uh, forget their name. Anyway, um, they make Recollect is their, is their company and they've been doing a really good job. Yep, yeah, yep. That's it, that's it. One of the sponsors. And they've been great to work with too because we keep pushing them. We wanted to develop a 3D uh, tool for our artifacts and they, they developed one so that we could view them. Uh, this is the site here. This is where all our stuff goes. This is like our home base. So we've been spread out throughout the internet, but it was always good to have a, a copy at home as well. And this is what we've been sort of bringing everything under the, under the one shed. And um, it's still a work in progress, but it seems to be doing, doing a good job for us. Um, the next phase, that's the digitisation phase. The digitalisation is the other side of the coin, the opportunities that have been have become come available now that we've been able to digitise things. So the overlay of mapping is wonderful. That's why I love Chris's talk on uh, yesterday when he was talking about all those wonderful maps. Um, but to do that sort of work, you've got to digitise, you've got to find and digitise those original maps and then overlay them on Google. And this is what we've been doing in terms of um, acting almost like a time machine. So this one is the 1961 plan of a local area, uh, Maitland, and we've superimposed it on, on the Google 
landscape of 2019, you can use the sliders to see how the landscape has changed. And we do that with a whole variety of things, so you have layers. Um, here's another one. Um, we did 600 or so, 700 subdivision plans, and we just put them out online. All right, on our Flickr site, this fellow Lachlan Weatherall, who who is a um, an ex computing fella from the university, decided in Christmas of 2015 to Google map them all. So he Google mapped them, so we didn't have to search all these dark areas are areas where our plans are. So if you're in that street, you just log into you know you just zoom in, click that, and up comes the Flickr page with the high resolution plan. So when we are talking yesterday about what to do next at one of those sessions, um, this is the sort of stuff I see as, as next. It's seeing what the community does with the material and how it brings meaning in their own areas and makes it easier to find. These are other things, photographs, having photographs associated with the landscapes that they were created in. So these are 1890s images on the 1890s landscape of Newcastle. So it helps connect, um, connect different types of material to the landscape. So I love this sort of stuff. But at the moment, it's all very clumsy. We're doing it in, in Google, Google Map, you know, Google Maps. What I'd like is the sort of thing Tom Cruise was doing in you know, Minority Report, but we're not there yet. So we're actually pushing, pushing the IT, the coders, to, to do these sorts of things for us, do the impossible. <laughs> Um, this is the KFC that they built over our six and a half thousand year old Aboriginal site. These are the sorts of artifacts that we're scanning. We put the 3D artifacts in, um, in, in Recollect. Um, I had to apply archival principles to those artifacts because um, they were pulled out of the ground in scientific fashion using the grid and the depths for spits. But then when the archaeologists brought them out of the ground, they divided them up into type. And I, I couldn't understand why they did that. Um, Archivists like things in original order, so I spent about two weeks putting everything back into original order. Because I asked someone, can you show me the oldest artefact? And they couldn't. And then I, all through that process, I realised the beauty of GLAM is this, that we can communicate to one another. So rather than the archaeologists getting museum disease and dividing everything into type, uh, I, I sort of said to them, well, how about you put them into original order so we can actually create an evidential record? And then, then, we can, then we can sort of challenge the National Archives to change the definition of archives and what they mean by a definition of an evidential record. Um, at the moment, everything is, is Eurocentric. So there is no way that Aborig I don't know what it's like in New Zealand, whether um, the New Zealand definition of archives includes Maori dance and ritual and stories and, and artifacts and that sort of thing. But in Australia, none of that falls, none, none of that is evidential. All right, so I would like that to be, a, I would like it to be recognised, but it would take a bit of a, a change of, of mind. Um, and this is the, um, this is the VR thing that they did out of it. You can't get this at the moment. Um, we can get the images, but you can, this was done by our IT innovation team who did a three-dimensional version of the dig. So because I can't go there anymore, no one can visit the site because there's a KFC over the top. We can visit, visit it virtually by putting a headset on and then you can go into the trench and you can see each of these artefacts has, been, has almost, it's got its own Dewey number uh, that's been created out of the, out of the um, where it's been in the, in the depth of the dig. So every part of the dig, if it was found in, in uh, coordinate A3 and it's at a depth of spit 20, then that becomes its, its call number and all the metadata associated with it. Um, the other project that we were involved with was the um, 1891 Victoria Theatre. This is a theatre that they didn't knock down, but it's still there. Um, but we found all these wonderful archival records relating to it, and these are the innovation team here, the people that do the three-dimensional stuff for us, and they created the theatre from um, descriptions. There's no photographs of the inside of the theatre, but um, again, this is like a 2D version of it, but when you get the headset on, it's just wonderful to actually go and visit this theatre. And um, the power of this, these 3D technologies is such that um, it doesn't take much to fool, fool us, you know. When you're standing on these balconies, you feel ill, like you're up very, very high. So the power of the illusion is quite incredible, but it's a new way of being able to bring um, historic records to life in a new way. 
The other thing I'd love to do with this, which we haven't done, but someone we might do, is actually have a performance in there. So we have a virtual performance inside the recreation of a 1891. I mean, these are the sorts of things that, that can be done if we, if we understand that the sort of material we're generating is not just unfinished with us. It goes out into the community and then the communities get to do work with the material. But to do it, they've got to get access to the, to the high resolution scans. The other thing about this stuff is that this material, um, 30 years of these records were sitting in some guy's garage. Um, and I found a footnote dedicated to him that was from 1988, but we were still able to track him down in 2017. That was the power of the Newcastle network. He was holidaying in Queensland, and they managed to track him down thousands of kilometres away. So um, that's that. Um, all right, so then we get to the digital age that we're in. And there was a wonderful show called The End of Memory, which came out last year which had some pretty shocking uh, stats about what we're actually creating. So I said for a regional place like Newcastle, we created 350 million digital things. Okay, so the average age of an inscription on stone is 10,000 years. That's how long it's expected to last for. On parchment, 1,000 years. On film, 100 years. On vinyl, 50 years. On CD-ROM, CD-ROMs were supposed to be the 500-year solution until some French team in 2003 found a little corrosive problem. And all of a sudden, that vision of the CD being the be-all and end-all, this was going to be the answer to all our memory woes, was gone. So they just became another bit of plastic or aluminium. And then they started showing these sorts of statistics. And this is what really scared me. Um, this is data on a planetary scale. So per day, 145 billion emails are sent, 2.5 trillion bytes of data created. A byte is eight bits, a single character of text, three kilobytes, one page, one megabyte, 300 pages, one gigabyte, one library, one DVD, five libraries. One terabyte, six million books, 200 DVDs, 200 meter stack of DVDs equals a petabyte. Then they start talking about uh, one exabyte, which is one kilometre of DVDs, all the digital data created in 2003. And then they describe a stack of DVDs from um, the Earth to the Moon, which is 1.8 zettabytes, which was all the data that was created in 2011. And then one yottabyte, which they said was a stack of DVDs from the Sun to Mars, which is all the data to 2016. Five. Oh, my God. So we're cute. how we, I mean, Alan Watts to the IBM engineers said um, this, this, these lines. If I'm going to make a big pitch is that we've run into a cultural situation where we have confused the symbol with the physical reality, the money with the wealth and the menu with the dinner, and we're starving on eating menus. So the moral of the story is uh, don't confuse the menu with the meal. These are all clips from movies, which in the longer version, I could tell you about. Glantopia, this is what I think we should be moving towards. Um, future of memory, to me, is sharing. The only things that have survived from the ancient world in their complete form are the complete works of Plato and the Bible. The only reason they did it was because everybody shared. Um, and don't place anything on the internet that you wouldn't want anyone else to steal. I had a dream in 1992 of this, of a vision of heaven. And the vision of heaven was this dark, polished crater. I only saw it for a glimpse, but it was this dark, polished crater. That was heaven. And I asked some Americans who interpreted dreams what they thought of it. They said, this is almost like all of this, this crater is polished by a billion souls. So all our lives, they just cascade into this thing like meteorites and they polish that crater just little bit by little. Then there's this beautiful, beautiful illusion in one of Plato's works, Alcibiades I, uh, where he's talking about the metaphor of the soul. And the soul is, again, um, is something, you know how you see the eyes of the mirrors of the soul? 
And he's asking about um, the idea of looking into another's eyes. And I just wanted to connect those three ideas for you. The, the dark obsidian mirror that John Dee wanted to know the future and divine the future that the Aztec priests used. Uh, my dream of this gigantic polished crater, black polished crater, and the pupil of the eye. So maybe in answer to Deb's question this morning of how do we get outside of our own heads, maybe we just have to look into one another's eyes. Okay, so we have about three minutes for questions. Um, please do speak into the mic for accessibility reasons and it will come up on the video. Um, what's the, the copyright? You've, so you're saying that you've digitized the MBN archives and you're doing that. Is there copyright issues in terms of making those publicly no, available? No, because um, uh, they're so happy to have access to their archival footage for shows and programs. And the way that they've been targeting is that they've been doing the year before the anniversary so at the moment uh, last year they digitized everything for 2019 which were things dating back to 1989 and 1969 and 1979 and they're doing the same thing each year so they 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 provide the station with all this material that they can use when they're doing retrospectives so there's no copyright anyway i strangled the person down to the ground who was the head of marketing at nine because three of the metadata sides of these things were sponsored by a, a Stockton pensioner who's our benefactor and she's 94 and I said to her we locked everything down waiting for Channel 9 to give us the okay to release it all because I wanted it all free and I said look she's 94 I don't want Vera to die while you know we're waiting for you to twiddle your thumbs and over the phone she said to me go ahead release it all that's fine <laughs> so, um, so, t so Channel 9 yeah okay yeah. Yeah, maybe they so should you, have you a can guilt them into you. doing these sorts of things I'm a teacher, so you know, you've got to wait a little while just to make sure. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. Please join me again in thanking Johnny.